You're listening to The Table, a podcast series from students at Christian Theological Seminary. Pull up a seat. There is a space at the table for everyone. Well, all I hear all day long at school is how great Marsha is at this or how wonderful Marsha did that. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Ah, yes. Nothing like a sibling rivalry. Or at least those moments where siblings don't get along and somebody has to step in and make peace. Kind of reminds me of all the times I used to yell at my older brother for bothering me and I could hear my mom from the other room yell, Leave your sister alone! (laughs) Yeah, like that. And he knew in that moment he had to play nice. And kind of like that, in the previous episode, Cynthia helped us navigate the discomfort of being at the table with our siblings, especially when our expectations, experiences, or otherwise are misaligned. But what happens when siblings aren't going at each other and instead are, you know, actually getting along? What happens when Martha and Mary are engaging communally towards similar goals and in the same direction? And how can we as observers even be empowered by their narratives? Well, let's pull up a chair at the table again in John 12 and find out why everyone's gathered there in the first place. At the top of John chapter 12, we're introduced to Martha, Mary, Lazarus, Jesus, and the disciples all gathered around the table just six days before Passover. In verses 1 through 10, Jesus and the disciples have returned to what is assumed the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, where he's given a dinner in his honor. Martha is serving everyone at the table, and in another movement, Mary has taken some very expensive oil, poured it on Jesus' feet, and begins wiping his feet with her hair. Judas, with ulterior motives, rebukes this action from Mary because of his own greed. And Jesus interjects and demands that Judas leave Mary alone because she was performing a noble act by using the oil to anoint Jesus now instead of when he's gone. However, that's not the entire narrative. The only reason everyone's at the table is because of the previous scene in chapter 11 where Jesus receives notice about Martha and Mary's brother, Lazarus, being sick. Fast forward to verse 17 and through the rest of this chapter. It's almost as if we're in a waiting room and overhear the news about a family and the prognosis of their loved one. Jesus, the doctor, has gone to see Martha and Mary and ultimately raised Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus isn't the focus here. Much like the narration in Luke, each sister engages with Jesus differently, just as they do with each other. However, what's seen in chapters 11 and 12 of the Gospel of John are the two sisters interacting, or serving even, in parallel for a main cause, which is Jesus. Hmm. Now I'm kind of wondering why the author of John chose to narrate the sisters' relationship with each other and with Jesus in this way. Fortunately, these aren't questions or thoughts I have to explore alone. Dr. Parker is the Assistant Professor of New Testament and Greek at McAfee School of Theology. She received her MTS from Duke Divinity School and her PhD in Bible, Culture, and Hermeneutics, New Testament focus, from Chicago Theological Seminary. She teaches courses in New Testament, Greek exegesis, the Gospel of Mark, the Corinthians Correspondence, the Gospel of John, and Womenist and Feminist Hermeneutics unto Preaching. In her research, Dr. Parker merges womanist thought and post-colonial theory while reading biblical texts. Dr. Parker is the author of If God Still Breathes, Why Can't I? Black Lives Matter and Biblical Authority, and a forthcoming book, Faith Unlynched. Dr. P, thank you so much for joining me today at the table. Um, before- thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before we hang out with our friends in John's Gospel, Um, I wanted to begin by asking, what was the defining moment that became the catalyst for breathing life into the work you do today as Mm. a womanist post-colonial biblical scholar? Oh, there are a few things that are 
that are a part of the catalyst that breathe life into what I do as a womanist post-colonial scholar. I, my own identity is the first thing that comes to mind because I got womanism from my mother and I didn't even realize I was getting womanism from my mother. Mm. Alice Walker coined the term womanism from a Southern expression where mothers told their daughters, you act in womanish, meaning we were asking too many questions. We wanted to know everything. We were constantly asking why. Constantly asking why was me. And so <laughs> I, when I got to undergrad, this was even before seminary, I was introduced to Dolores Williams' Sisters in the Wilderness. And as I was reading Sisters in the Wilderness, I was like, this is a thing? There, There's like you can study womanism because I read it. And I was like, oh my goodness, I know this. This is me. Yeah. So that was the first catalyst. The second catalyst was when I began my PhD journey, there were always folks who would say, well, womanism isn't a thing or mm-hmm. it's niche or it doesn't add anything to the conversations. And I was like, no, that's not true. So I always took that as challenge accepted. So that's the other catalyst as to why I do what I do. But then I would say that the relationship to womanism and post-coloniality also makes sense to me because when I think about like the Black Panther movement, for example. Mm -hmm. Black Panthers would look at the work of France Fanon and France Fanon's conversation on like decolonizing your mind. Mm -hmm. And so I always think about womanism as a post-colonial project that's all about decolonizing our minds from the ways that Eurocentricity takes precedence in biblical interpretation. So all of that has come together for me as to why I do what I do. In your work, you know, you share the importance of womanist identity when engaging uh, biblical texts just within the constructive processes um, for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, you know, how were you able to distinguish your womanist identity from that of, say, Black feminism or even just without Mm -hmm. those identifiers? Because, right, you just named that there are some that are just like, (laughs) no, that's niche. Just just let it be what, you know, what has pushed you into womanism specifically. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, Because folks said that womanism was niche, you always have to ask, well, if it's niche, what is, quote unquote, the norm? Yeah. And the norm is what like an Elizabeth Schilzer Fiorenza would call male stream biblical interpretation. And it's white biblical interpretation or white Eurocentric biblical interpretation. Then you have to ask if white male biblical interpretation would be considered niche. Mm. And so now you're beginning to strip away the veneer or the look of objectivity from these folks who claim objectivity but they're really not objective. They're just white male stream. And so for me, I argue that they're just as subjective as womanism because that's the pushback that people will give womanism. You're too subjective. I'm like, oh no, I just name my subjectivity. And then black feminism. So sometimes I will um, identify as black feminist because in the classical definition of womanism, it's a, it's a black feminist. Mm -hmm. And I still hold on to womanism though, because as what I would, I would consider myself a third wave womanist. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the work of Ebony Janice, so Ebony Janice is all black girls are activists. She identifies her as fourth wave feminine or fourth wave womanism and is really taking the activism and the rest to the next next wave. And for me, as a third wave, I hold on to womanism as an identity, which is very different from the first wave, because the first wave actually had problems with LGBTIQA plus relationships. Mm-hmm. So I hold on to womanism and really specifically try to say that 
I am a womanist who is also very much in solidarity with my LGBTQIA plus siblings. So I'm, I'm trying to distinguish myself from the homophobia of the first wave of womanism and, but still keep the name womanism because it's always meant something to me because yeah. as, as I've said, I, I got womanism from my mother's knee. So I like still naming myself as womanist and womanist um, or understanding womanism as opposed to black feminism. But I understand why some black feminists hold on to black feminists as their identifying uh, nomenclature because womanism had its homophobic, homophobic issues in the beginning. And so they did not want to be in the same camp or the same name as womanist. I'm always trying to hold space for all of us. I think mm -hmm. as I'm still wrestling with it uh, in the sense of contemplative wrestling, right? Figuring mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. where I find myself in any of those identifiers, it's just really powerful and beneficial to hear you name, here's how I arrived here. It doesn't mean that I'm excluding this other work here. If anything, it's it's working in conjunction with the things that I'm doing. It's just sometimes yeah. this area, this lane is more amplified because of where I come from. Uh, kind of pivoting towards John 11 a little bit, I was wondering just even from, you know, your experience, your scholarship, the research, the work that you've done, um, how might John's authorship mm -hmm. shape the way in which Martha and Mary have been interpreted or are even interpreted today? So John, the gospel of John, when I think about John's gospel, I have to realize and remember that there are so many players throughout the gospel of John. And when you take John's gospel from beginning to end, you begin to see that there has been a conversation all throughout about who actually is almost closest to Jesus, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I see John's gospel as very competitive and if you take seriously the work of Warren Carter and think about the Gospel of John as growing up or being written somewhere in Ephesus in the 90s, 100s, somewhere in that time period, mm -hmm. you have a church in Ephesus that is trying to figure out its relationship to empire, but also its relationship to one another. Yeah. And when I think about the Gospel of John, you you can really see how people are trying to figure out their relationship to one another and also their Jewish families as well. Yeah. And I think John's Gospel is wrestling with that even as it's telling the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I I like um Lewis Martin's work. Is it Yes, yeah, J Lewis Martin's work where he talks about the gospel of John as a two level drama mm -hmm. that it's being written in the nineties or hundreds, but it's taking the, the, the time and the, the ideas that are happening in the nineties and placing it with Jesus in the thirties. And if you take that seriously, John's gospel is really just working some things out. Mm -hmm. It's working things out and it's a community that's really trying to understand who they are. And I think that's the main thing we have to realize as we begin to read John's gospel. Who are they in relationship to each other and who are they in relationship to Jesus? And who is the actual leader of this community as well? Because... It's John 12. So it's after our John 11 passage. It's John 12 that we're introduced to the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple was not named any other time beforehand. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you have this person on the scene. You're like, who is this person? And so it's, it's a fascinating gospel that's just working itself out. And here's the other thing. Sorry. I'm now oh, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> But I remember being in ministry and often saying, well, if you want to understand who Jesus is, 
This is before I went to seminary. So mm-hmm. this is me repenting of the ways that I used to disciple people before I went to seminary. I would say, if you want to understand Jesus, read the gospel of John and you'll get this great understanding of who Jesus is. And I think that's true, but I think we do a disservice, especially if we're in church settings and we're discipling new Christians yeah. and telling them to read the gospel of John, that they miss other elements of Jesus if they don't read Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Yeah. And and then kind of get to the gospel of John. The gospel of John has this higher, I would say, Christology than the other gospels. And so what does it look like to wrestle with a more human Jesus as mm-hmm. opposed to this more super high Christological Jesus. You're bringing up like all of the the really distinct nuances um, that, that come to mind for me when I think of the gospel of John, just even in comparison mm-hmm. to its, you know, sy- synoptic counterparts. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, you're coming from this time frame, this Greco-Roman world, Hellenistic Judaism, like you mentioned, they're still trying to figure out all the things. Um, Mm -hmm. At the same time where the appeal is to like the insiders, so to speak. Right. And then it's it's kind of pushing this case against those that fall outside of the insiders, which often John will will reference as the Jews um, or Gentiles in and of that. So it's like all these different tensions that are happening all over the place all at once. And to your point, I definitely agree that there's a disservice that's done when we overlook the context in which uh, this composition was built. Yeah. I think that both Luke and John bring women to the forefront. And I think that it's their wrestling again with who's the actual leader within Mm -hmm. the early Jesus movement. Because we have to realize when you get to the end of the gospel of John, you have Mary Magdalene, you have Peter, you have the disciple whom Jesus loved, all running towards the tomb. Now, when I teach that passage at John 21 with Mary Magdalene, I actually have students read it without the Peter and beloved disciple running. And you can read it, and this is the work of Anne Graham Brock out at University of Denver, Iliff. You can read it without the Peter and the beloved disciple narrative there, Mm -hmm. and it flows straight through. So what does that mean? That the Johannine writer probably inserted that piece for the one reason I can think about immediately is that you can't just have a woman saying or testifying to the risen Lord. You have to have two other male witnesses. And so the Johannine writer is quote, quote unquote, fixing something Mm. that does not happen in Matthew and Mark. Luke fixes it as well by having Peter run to the tomb at the end of the gospel of Luke. So even though Luke and John, I think forefront women, they still backhandedly say, but they're still not good representatives which is always problematic. Mm. But I also want to remind us that Mary Magdalene was a recognized leader, even if her God of Mary Magdalene did not make it into our canon. But you have all these leaders in the early church and people are like, who's the one to follow? And I think the Gospel of John is, is recognizing Mm -hmm. especially Mary Magdalene's leadership. And so I guess as we're still sitting, you know, in our, in our womenist lens, um, Mm -hmm. I think I want to dig a little bit deeper into Martha and Mary. Now, personally, this is just a personal journey of mine. (laughs) Um, I think Martha has gotten a bad rap, right? I, I, I want to be able to cut her just a little bit of slack. And in that same breath, Uh, While using some of what you've named in your work, I think that also white male biblical scholarship um, in some ways has really pedestalized Mary and really casted this shadow over maybe some of her character flaws. Now, this isn't not this is not me trying to indict Mary in any way, shape or form. But what what I hope to do, just even in my own journey and in this conversation with you um, and and analyzing 
this narrative in John is to really be able to reframe these sisters in a way that not only reclaims them from the margins, um, it characterizes them, but also just allows them to act as representative. Um, yes. I find it so ironic that Lazarus, the one with no voice, the entirety of the story is usually mm-hmm. the focal point. And I'd argue that the sisters are the vehicle for that to even become what it is. But I'd love to hear your insights on, you know, why you think um, Jesus responds to each sister differently in John 11. Uh, wow. I love this question. <laughs> you have this in John 11, mm-hmm. but you also have the story of what, Luke? that I think we often read together. And I think we have to take each in its own context. Mm -hmm. Martha and Mary in the word or in the, in the, I want to say like the context of the gospel of John in the world of the gospel of John, I think that they're both polarizing women who actually have their own things. They have their own stuff together that I think in the context of both the gospel of John, they both have their conversations and their issues with Jesus. I think in the context of the gospel of Luke, it seems like they make Martha have more of an issue or a problem or an argument with Jesus. So Here's the question then for me. If if it's at all possible that the writer of the Gospel of John knew anything about the tradition of the Gospel of Luke, is the Gospel of John writer kind of more equalizing Mm -hmm. the ways that Mary and Martha relate to Jesus? Now, I don't know that. But I think it's just an interesting conversation, especially when we want to kind of uplift both women yeah. and get them out of the doghouse of white male traditional readings that tend to place blame no matter what on yeah. women across the board. In your perspective, you know, what does the the story, this this quick story in, in chapter 12 of Martha and Mary just teach us, you know, not only about serving, but serving in community? That is a really good question. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that Martha is serving and the Greek word is diakoneo, mm. diakoneo. And it's a verb that is also connected to the idea of the deaconate. So the deacons are the ones who also serve. Yeah. But there's also that title of deacon. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Martha is doing a service for Jesus in her serving similar to the way that Mary is doing her service. How might these sisters or just any women of the canonical Bible, how might we be able to reclaim them from what you've named as white supremacist authoritarianism? I think just by what we've done already, we have to be able to stand in conversations with people that still read Mary and Martha from these limited views. Yeah. And we have to be able to actually open up our mouths and combat against that. I, I've i been doing much more social media things lately, and it's it's crazy to me. It, I shouldn't use the word crazy. It, it's, it's mind-boggling to me how I can really specifically get Men in my comments on videos that I post or um, little blogs that I do who are just like, that's not how you read Bible or that's not how you should understand that or that's not, that's not right. Or you're, you're um, heretic or you're, you know, you're not orthodox or you're this or you're that. And I'm just like, first of all, why are you coming up on my page? I'm the one with the PhD. (laughs) 
And second of all, you think I'm really going to engage with your view of revelations when the text is actually revelation? Don't come up here with that bull. You can't play with me like that. <laughs> so I'm a lot of times I'm just like, oh, no, I, and, and I'll say, I don't have to engage with you. And why do you think that you can come with your not clearly thought out words and just come and play in, in my, in my, you know, in my space. We will leave it at that. Dr. P, I want to thank you so much for pulling up a chair <laughs> to my table to talk a little bit about John and Martha and Mary and just unpack all of that and providing your insight and wisdom and scholarship. I'm immensely grateful. Um, any lasting thoughts before we, we end here? No, I just remind every one of us to continue on in our boldness and our braveness and in our brilliance. <laughs>